Okay, welcome. So, thanks for having a full class on uh, today, being everyone here. A um, few things first, the boring stuff first, but probably the most exciting one for you because uh, it's about marks. Point is assignment three. Uh, how many of you actually have formed groups, formally or informally? So quite a, quite a number of them, right? How many of those groups are actually have specified their groups on GitLab? A subset. <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. That's fine. I mean, we're fundamentally interested to figure out if anyone really doesn't have any group yet, right? So we need to fi uh, ensure that everyone is involved and that at submission deadline or around that time frame that everyone has, you know, put their stuff on, on GitLab so we know whom, you know, who is involved in which group. Is there anyone who's, who didn't manage to find a group yet? Okay. So we have in Discord, there is one channel. Did anyone post to you? Uh, did you try to post to this one? There's a channel in this talk, Discord that says, uh, remind me, group market? Group forming. Group forming. I don't know who. Some people found so quite. Please post fine. there if you're still looking for groups. I understand there's probably more of you here that, you know, uh, don't want to. Uh, there's research on group forming. Yeah. Group forming, sorry. So basically post there and see if you can join another group or join your neighbors here right now and ask, hey guys, do you need another person doing something X? Because it means, thank you for being quiet, my dear students. So, um, crazy people. So, um, but just see if they can expand the scope a bit and fit you in perhaps, right? So it'd be really good if each of you has, a, has an opportunity. And since the third assignment is so open ended, you should have, you know, there should be always an opportunity to add some bells and whistles. That is enough for one additional member, right? All right, that was the easy bit, the hard bit now. Uh, on In two weeks, on Tuesday, this very time slot, you will present your results as far as they are you know, finished. So I think the deadline is on the Friday, I believe. Is that correct? On Tuesday. Oh, it's on Tuesday. Right. Being period. All right, cool. So that's that's perfect. So you're done by then anyway. What we want you to do is not a formal presentation. You don't need to wear... You, well, you should wear a dress code, of course, but uh, no, you can just come casually. But we would like you to actually share and your tuxedos ideas. Or Tuxedo, yeah. Well, you can you can rent them somewhere in this building. Anyway, um, no, just to present briefly what you did, was the what the concept was, and perhaps have others ask questions. Sometimes it's quite nice to get feedback from others, but also just to you know give us a good overview of the portfolio that you guys have come up with, right? So especially since we only see four projects in, in GitLab right now, we actually just don't appreciate the depth that you. Uh, have come up with. So that's the plan for um, Tuesday and two weeks, right? Yeah. So just be prepared for that on the very day that you have something ready. It doesn't need to be a PowerPoint, it can be if you want, but most likely it should be your application. And see how actually, or oh, one of the hard things when you deal with uh, cloud applications is actually to show functionality, especially if it's in the API, right? So because many of you will not spend much time on you know, having a beautiful front end, so like, but still, you need to convey the functionality. If you have, of course, that's even easier, right? But presenting cloud applications sometimes quite hard compared to other more aesthetic-centered um, um, applications, right? So, are there any questions regards, uh, to, with regards to the um, presentation? It's about to say exam. Yeah, so actually, in two weeks' time, that's not the deadline. The deadline is a week after. So in two weeks' time, we are still one week before the deadline. So they may not be done. We can swap it, so we can do the presentation. And it's up the course, though. Twenty third is the end of the uh, lectures. That's the Friday. So that's yeah, you're right. You're right. It, it is that Tuesday. Yeah, it's, it's Tuesday fine. Two it's weeks. Fine. It is Tuesday in two weeks. Yes, correct. Right. Sorry. No, so cool. So in two weeks, now we figured it out. So in two weeks and Tuesday, please have something ready yeah. on Friday. Uh, so ideally, also, uh, so how many groups do we have right now? Could uh, pair group, I would leave, please have one, see one, uh, like to see one hand so I can gauge the number of groups. So if any uh, any other group members already raising their hands, please don't do it. One, are you two groups or one? One. One, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten to eleven groups, so they're because they're still a bit murky water, so um, how much time do we have then? Five minutes per group, right? Max? Yeah, Plus two minutes I, for question. It will be a short, kind of a short show and tell. Yeah, it's really yeah. short show and tell. So there's not much time for going into it in, in great depth. Yeah. It's really, so I don't think you will need to spend an extensive amount of time on prep on that one if you have actually written uh, and done something. Cool. But so we need to be quite efficient on that day, uh, getting, getting the uh, message across, I guess. On the Friday after that, so the very last session of that um, course, um, as you expect, you get your fourth assignment. No. 
we'll talk about the exam, right? So, um, because most likely you want to have, get some heads up on it because it's 60% of that course. We plan to change it in the future, but for now, yeah, 60%. So, um, so, and I assume that you have a lot of questions of how, what we need to do, you know, what is in the exam. And um, so please bring those for that very session. And of course we, you know, run over course material that we deem relevant for that course. Not all of it will be relevant because some of them was a bit left and right on the sidelines to give you a bit of perspective and, you know, um, you know, inspire you to look into certain aspects. But uh, we can't, of course, ask you um, to review everything in a way, but um, we'll, we'll narrow it down on that day, right? Yeah. So bear in mind, so the last week will be quite in intense-ish because it affords your involvement to some extent. Good. I think questions about the exam is a bit premature, so we're not doing that. Any other issues on your hearts or elsewhere that you want to raise? Mine's? Ah, yeah. oh, there's a question. Um, oh, there's a question. Good. Is it, uh, can we get some example questions from earlier exams? Like this mm. uh, yeah, we will talk about some example questions on the session. No. Okay, we'll bring up some in the, in the uh, session. So, uh, point is, we we will be in a situation of completely rewriting the exam for uh, for many reasons, but the most dominant one being that we need to hold a ex digital exam, or we will hold we, a digital we exam. We didn't have digital exams. We didn't before. have before. So the questions were prepared for writing sort of short essays, uh, question type. That, that's very different right, from what we, we want. We will to. not do from now on because in digital form we don't want to have that format. Okay. So the questions will be different, but we will bring some example questions of what you can expect. Yeah. So uh, on that Friday uh, exam help thing, do we get to know the layout of the exam? Like yes. Only multiple choice? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The yeah. rules of the game will be discussed. Exactly. Um, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, yeah. We so we held two digital exams before already. So oh. now it will be a new iteration. Well, we have fun. Both were fun, but they were in different courses. So it's always, you know, getting your first hand on this this course, of course, uh, as well. Um, so any questions are really helpful that drive us in the right direction as well. Um, but yeah, by then we'll have, um, you know, sketch out what you guys need to look at. We don't really, we appreciate the fact that you actually put quite a lot of work into the course already up to now. I think, right? It's a bit hands on and uh, quite practical. You need to learn a lot of stuff on the fly. So uh, we, we don't want to bury you in you know, theory or whatever else. And you may have gathered we don't do that in this course. Um, so it will not be the case in the exam. But uh, we will test, for example, whether you actually have interacted with Go. Right? We haven't quite figured out how to do that yet. But we ask you questions that let us gauge whether you actually know the language to some extent. Yeah? But pseudocode will probably not part of it. But it's really more like understanding uh, concepts. Good. Any other questions? Other questions, of course. Please. Will you give us the answers to the exam? Please, yes. Yes, we will give us the answers now. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that, that means uh, the exam will be in that exam safe browser thing. So we'll need Windows. That is the yeah, problem, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're not kind of aware of all the problems, but there are some problems with the particular version of the clients and, and so on. And on Windows, it works, we know for sure. Mm. Uh, it is possibility for those people who don't use Windows to request like a laptop for the exam, uh, and I think that has happened in the past. Uh, uh, you, you can if you don't want to install uh, this piece of malware on your own computer. You can ask for uh, a computer to borrow yeah. from the. Uh, well, you need to do it in advance, I suspect. Yeah, right? from from the IT department here, and they will. Um, let you borrow a small shit laptop that you can use. Yeah. Is, uh, is yeah. Good. Thanks. That sounds good. Uh, yeah, that's that's the concern, but it's slightly outside our so control. It's our jurisdiction. I mean, because that's that. the assessment it's is the done externally. Examination office, which will and IT, which does yeah. all those things. Right? And we're kind of actively encouraged to go digital anyway. So even if you were to say, let's go, you know, paper based, we can, but it's it's no, that's not the direction. Anymore. Uh, oh, by can't. 2020, we have to have all exams digital. Uh, that's the kind of uh, cut off. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to learn quickly because we only have two iterations to do to go. Right, so there was an additional question about the deadline being extended. So the deadline wasn't really extended, but for those students who failed to meet the deadline, they can submit stuff after the deadline and they will be marked differently. 
Um, so if you want to make your assignment better, you shouldn't, because then we take into account that you have commits beyond the deadline. But those who have nothing and they need two extra weeks to do something, they can do this and then they have to mark it in the uh, spreadsheet that the deadline for those students were extended for assignment one and two, right? So formally the deadlines haven't been extended for anybody, uh, but if you haven't meet the deadline and you still want to do something, you can and then you just mark it in the... Um, what, what it's saying is, if at the deadline your code didn't work and you want to ensure that it actually works, you can fix that. You, you yeah. pay, pay the price, but at least you have a working assignment. Yeah, exactly. That's basically it. But if you want to attach bells and whistles, fine tune it, don't. Don't do that, yeah. Invest your time in assignment three. So that's the, that's the message. Questions about this? So no penalties for the guys that were on time, put it this way, right? So um, that's the main main yeah. message, I guess. Yeah. Then again, cross. Okay, um, right. So after this interesting part of the lecture, we're now getting to the boring part of the lecture. That is the content that you guys need to uh, absorb again. Um, right, question to the five people that were here on Friday. Um, what did we talk about? No, actually, question to the rest of you that, who watched the stream, of course. Um, <laughs> of course. What did we talk about on Friday? No, in fact, anyone, doesn't matter. Please. Docker. Okay, what does it do? We just talked about that we used an image and uh, mounted it in a yep. container. Yeah, so we Docker, image, container, a lot of terminology here, isn't it? And we talked about this quite some time before already. So why did we talk about this again? Oh, ah, over there, please. Uh, we talked about loading multiple images, so uh, if you could load an image and then uh, instead of having to install lots of different things or go through a lot of steps to just uh, load the image, it already has that installed. Uh, of course, we also talked about the fact that you shouldn't make such images unless it's actually stable, because it's supposed to be of stable or of stable uh, setups, mm -hmm. not for debugging or testing. Very nice. Very nice. So, very good point there. So, we are entering the realm of deployment, right? So, and unlike development where we kind of really want to be, you know, um, uh, use the latest technology, try out stuff and want to do debugging, when we deploy, we kind of want to ensure that we have a uh, uh, um, predictable, kind of deterministic situation that we actually can predict how the outcome will be. So, right? So, stability is one of the factors. So, question back. Um, so, if we say we have a complex system, right? So, it consists of uh, let's say a database, uh, surprise, surprise, an API, and some perhaps another third service. Why don't you just, you know, put it into one image? Everything is done easy, one image. I would like that. It's super easy. Uh, maybe you want choices. Maybe you want something in a specific version. Uh, maybe there are something you need that is incompatible with one of them, so you want to switch it out. And then installing something that you don't need because you're going to use something else, that would be a bit unnecessary. Cool. So I like the incompatibility thing. That's very true, right? So you have multiple services that rely, for example, on different versions of Python underneath, right? So some framework, some database, let's say, hypothetically, then you have a conflict in the image. So that's a pretty bad situation. Yes, so there's a bit of uh, 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 some, some aspects there of complexity. What was your point? Uh, single point of failure. Ah, yeah, okay. You don't want uh, your entire complex architecture to just rely on one image because if that fails, everything fails. Yeah, cool, very good. Yeah, that's a good one as well. So you kind of minimize the bottlenecks uh, that you have in your systems, yeah? Um, other points? So both valid points. What else? Why do we use multiple containers? Why not, you know, one giant container? I mean, those are good points, but not all the points, please. Uh, they're self-contained. So uh, you can have uh, different dependencies that are found in multiple containers. Yeah, that was roughly what you mentioned before, right? So, or did I misunder misread this? So, uh, that, that you have software that's incompatible within the same container? Was that the point you made before? Okay, but, uh, but it, that's, a, that's a, of course, a valid point, right? So, if you have um, conflict and dependencies, yes, of course, you do, wouldn't want to put them in the same container. But again, you have a big system. You have database, you have API, and probably some external service or not. Why it, should they be in one container or not? And why or why not? For Please. resource management, you can, through Docker Swarm, place uh, uh -huh. different containers on different machines. All right. One would be more optimized for database, and one would be more optimized for handling requests. That's right. So um, 
Uh, yep, I comment there. Cool, right. So those are both great points. Um, so the idea was there basically you can efficiently distribute, you know, functionality to, for example, machines that are, yeah, you know, a better gear to support it, right? More memory, more processing power, for example, right? So you, you, you decompose your architecture a bit, right? So that makes it a bit more flexible. Um, and you have good resource constraints and so on. What other aspect was, uh, did we talk about? In, similar to that, but if you think about load, System. Exactly. What's replication? Exactly. Right. So one of the points there was assuming that we have. So now it comes the awful drawing part. Don't pretend you can understand what I draw. Just be nice to me and say you do. Um, so hang on. Um, said water. I bet that's a permanent one. I'm pretty good at finding those. Things. Right. Okay. So assuming you have two different services, right? One of them being the DB, um, one being the web, right? So we kind of need to ensure a sort of consistency in the database, right? Because that's actually where the persistent data is stored, right? But it gives us the flexibility to actually, as you say, scale up based on demand, right? So we can spin up yet another um, container for the web part of it, right? And link it also to the database. This way we're kind of decomposing the system for scalability, right? So classical use for cloud services is you know, e-commerce, web shop, during Christmas time. Surprise, surprise, there may or may not be more requests, right? So the point is, if, you're, if your shop is really shitty, you don't need to worry about scalability because people won't come to you. But if it's reasonably popular, you better want to think about this before that, right? Else you will not have customers because your system doesn't scale. So it's a two ways you need to think about it. And it plays all together with the capacity planning here. But the key thing is actually to de de decompose systems, parts that are scalable and that may not be scalable. Please. Uh, how can you redirect uh, the users to the different web uh, containers? Right. Um, so this will be, in this case, the entry point will be most likely here, right? So you have the shared entry point, a load balancer that's provided. Uh, Amazon has those, those things out of the box. And basically, will redirect either systematically in a round robin fashion, right? So first request, second request, third request, fourth request, across all possible uh, instances of those ones. But those web containers will point, in this case, for example, to the same database uh, uh, container, right? Because that's a shared storage you interact with. So, so all the traffic will go through the load balancer? And yes. Uh, okay. So it will basically guard the system, right? Any comments on that? Well, no, it's, it's a single point of entry, but that, that, that single point of entry only does load balancing, like yeah. forwarding requests. Exactly. So this thing is really specialized to one thing that is just redirecting traffic. Uh, think about it like a you know yeah like an efficient router right so very focused and gateway level router that is able to inspect uh, uh, content as well but after that your system comes into play and allows you basically to flexibly uh, scale up and down and those instances don't need to know each uh, anything about each other here right but they need to know about this guy right they also need to have those sessions between yeah okay of course you need to deal you know ensure that you have the same session and they're routed to the to the right uh, 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 web containers and so on right. But that's the main idea, what, what we're talking about when we decompose, that we have this scalability uh, uh, option at least, right? So and that's something you need to, I mean, um, there's always the discussion at least, um, yeah, I often have the discussion, okay, why do we do this, right, in the first place? Isn't that here um, system administration problems, right? So operations. But the point is, now we actually, those both words are kind of a bit linked here, right? So at the same time, you as a developer, as well as the administrator, need to know how the system is structured and you need to plan that out and that's why it's useful for you to start thinking in containers as well. Even if you're not running operationally, even if you don't do want to deal with something that's called swarm, whatever that was. Um, so, you know, because you see it's, it's something of a different world, but if you have a shared language of Docker containers, <coughs> it makes sense, right? You, you decompose the service and let the operations people uh, deal with actually running it efficiently. On that note, what's Docker Swarm? Docker Swarm is... Uh basically a, a, a service that lets you put up uh, different, uh, a lot of different uh, containers of the, that are the same or different. You can say you want two DB containers and five web containers and stuff like that, and it will uh, dynamically keep it, uh, keep it, keep it up. Mm -hmm. If one of them fails, it would uh, delete that one and start up a new one. 
and stuff like that. It's really handy from an admin point of yeah. view. So yeah, so your point is, but with Docker Swarm, we talk about Docker Compose. How is that different from Docker Swarm? You can also run multiple containers. Please. Docker Swarm uses Compose files to compose stacks of containers. Yeah. So that yeah. How is that compared to Kubernetes? Uh, it's an alternative solution, right? So uh, sitting sitting below Docker Swarm is easier to manage. I guess the Kubernetes setup is much more complex. Um, but it's um, Kubernetes is also flexible with respect to other container solutions. So it's not necessarily constrained to or Docker only, whereas Docker Swarm is. Um, but unfortunately, we do not going down that route. You guys went down that route. And what do we have to say about that route? Docker Swarm versus Kubernetes? Is that something that you did? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. So, um, yeah, we are not going that far down the uh, stack. Um, we were thinking about running a Cloud 2 course or an advanced cloud specialization eventually, but uh, every time we plan this for this course, we're not getting there. <laughs> so, because we don't have the time and space to do it, right? And also, it's more from a program perspective right now. But we want to clear, be clear that this interface of Docker in the first place is something we would arrive at um, together. Please. There's also existing courses here that cover up. Yeah. Uh, that's the, what's IMT? No, what's it called? Three? Infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code. Uh, Are they doing Kubernetes there? Yeah. Good. One week, of course. Right, that's uh, Eric, right, is it? Yeah. Running it. Okay, cool, yep. So we talk to those guys, see if we link up our efforts, but it's usually traditionally a bit challenging to do that. All right, um, cool. All right, in addition, so last week, or last session rather, we just briefly talked about uh, Docker Compose. Didn't go quite get where we wanted to, and I will not repeat the entire session because else uh, the five people that were, be were here would feel actually blamed for being here. Um, that's not fair. We don't like that. So therefore, um, just a brief, brief idea. What was Docker Compose about? You mentioned that in, in, in one sentence, but it's from you guys. What is Docker Compose about? About stocking and configuring multiple Docker containers at once. Yeah. So when you run Docker containers, for example, thank you. When you run Docker containers, you do something like this oftentimes, right? So you run a particular container, you need to map ports, you need to deal with environment variables and everything that's all painful. Um, and you need to do it for every container you actually do, right? So we have the issue that there's multiple containers that usually rely on each other. I mentioned the example here, database versus the web API and so on, right? So there's also an assumption of order of starting, right? You want to start the database first before you start the web service and so on. And that's all something that the um, you know, user of your software doesn't, uh, shouldn't need to be dealing with, right? Then the assumptions that you built into the system when developing it should also be encoded, right? So it's a bit like infrastructure as code, the same principle there. Um, and that's why um, Docker Compose. And the idea is that it is, you get those kind of YAML files that sit on top of, well, on top, top of the individual containers, I mean, no, sorry, they compose individual containers and coordinate their uh, uh, startup and runtime management effectively. And you have files like this, that's the YAML format. So if you are acquainted with this file format elsewhere, it's yet another markup languages, a language is basically um, has multiple sections, one called services, second one's volumes, third one, I think, networks. <coughs> and uh, the idea is here that you specify different services uh, for example, here, uh, the first one is called DB, and it is an image of MySQL. Um, it has a certain data volume that data is stored in. It's always to be restored, uh, restarted if things go sideways, meaning the image comes down. And then it's some sort of environment variables, usually credentials, uh, uh, put in as well. And the second uh, service that would be hosted is basically the front end. That would be actually a web service for WordPress, for example, that depends, and that's the key, that depends on DB, so DB needs to be started first. And then you map the ports and all that kind of uh, stuff to actually get things um, done. So we looked at a bit more detail than I did last time, so I don't want to repeat it. If you haven't uh, had any exposure, have a look at the uh, last stream that we put out there. What I want to do is continue the exercise in the sense that uh, last session we actually looked at composing uh, individual um, containers into a systematic um, you know, application, if you like. And now I'm just starting up the, or looking at the machine that is still running since, um, um, since last uh, session. Just here to restart the uh, database, which because it made some problems, um, or it had some hiccups, uh, or probably it was me that shut it, shut it down. 
So what we have here is basically a very simple application. It's the web application uh, of a student code um, that is on, on Git, GitHub uh, somewhere. So you can actually look at it, download it, and use the same example for your own work. And I'm just pasting, I'm at least I'm trying to paste a simple um, query, curl query, um, that shows me whether things are fine. So the, what this does is basically a GET request to a particular URL, port 8080, which happens to be the student container thing here, and it basically spits out your student the students that are contained in it. They are non-contained in it, therefore it's empty. Um, for the sake of um, demonstration, we can just add one student. Similarly, it's a, a request that is uh, pre-formatted, and it adds a student named Jake, uh, Jack, sorry, age 21, and so on, uh, to that system. If we then do a get again, we should hopefully see that um, we get that student in the system. So we see the output here. Cool, so far so good. Two containers running independently, however, right? So they were all individually started. As you say, we used third-party software. We just downloaded the Mongo uh, uh, image as it is provided already. So we didn't do any configuration there ourselves, but just ran it and mapped it against port uh, 2717, if I get it right, um, because that's the standard port, as you will see here, right? So you see the port mapping here. If you run Docker PS, that shows you the running containers. 2717 uh, is the port, and 8080 is the one for our web service that we um, injected. All right, so the idea is now, um, just to give you an overview of the structure, we have this uh, folder here, IMT2681, and it basically contains, um, basically contains all the, uh, yeah, the individual information and the uh, individual modules. Uh, in, in CMD, is, that's where the executables are held. And what we have here is basically a Docker file that builds the student image. That's something we uh, built last session. So it has, it downloads. Again, if you don't know how Docker files look like, you need to have a look at the um, lecture slides and all the streams because we discussed it. We have a base image in this case, Golang 1.11, right? So you could use another one as well on a, a Linux um, Debian installation. In particular, we specify the maintainer, which is best practice. We uh, download something using Go Get, so that's how you natively invoke, or that's how you invoke native commands. Go Get in this case, uh, you specify a work directory, and then you build something and finally execute it. So quite straightforward, right? So effectively, five meaningful lines plus the maintainer to get stuff done, right? So no magic. Cool. Um, Right. My machine is a tad laggy. Um, hmm. Yes, I should stop streaming, right? Is that your suggestion? That's a good idea. Right. So, comments? No. Good. Okay. Um, Right. So, okay, let's build a Docker, uh, a, a Docker Compose file because that's what we uh, kind of need. So, right in the root directory of your particular repository, that's uh, a good time, uh, a good space actually, uh, to actually put your to put your uh, Docker Compose file. Right. So, and um, similar to Docker files, you um, it works based on convention, and you do that by simply naming the file Docker Compose uh, YAML. This is the default file name. I think you can modify it um, and then specify it when you run Docker Compose, if, it's, if you modified it, but this would be the one that Docker Compose looks uh, for by default. Um, by the way, um, before, I, before I forget to mention that Docker Compose needs to be installed in addition to Docker, right? So it's not part of the Docker um, installation itself, but actually needs to be uh, installed as well. The instruction for that um, can be found on the web page, quite straightforward. I'll just probably bring up the um, web page. My machine is really challenged today. Interesting. All right. So, and uh, this is the compose file documentation. But here about um, Docker compose. So uh, docs.docker.com compose install gives you the background of how to install it. Uh, let's click Linux here. Right. Uh, gives you all the details of how to do it. So it's a bit. Um, command line heavy, so, um, but yeah, that's how I do it. Basically, you download the uh, Docker Compose script in its current version, change some permissions, and you can run Docker Compose dev dev version. It's basically just a script, com you know, combining um, the individual com containers. But it's managed on the same web page, but again, it's the tool is independent from the Docker installation that you have done um, before. The first thing you do, if you look at uh, the Docker files, you need to specify a version. In this case, we say we actually use version three of the Docker tool. 
Uh, we have services, the section I mentioned just before. Uh, yeah, yeah. I so hope that's going to work today because it's very laggy. So, um, right. If you recall, um, if you want to, so in last session we uh, talked about this modified student version that runs both with a local database and an external Mongo database. And what we needed to provide was some external information. We needed to provide environmental data. Um, so, and providing environment variables is a bit tricky. Um, should that should those end up in a Docker Compose file? Environment variables. In the example before, we just saw some environment variables. Well, what do you think? That would be easier, uh, but it's also one would be harder. Harder? In what sense? Well, how do you route port eighty to eighty eighty, for instance? Uh, you you can specify that. So it's for example the the rerouting of ports is done here. If you look at the WordPress example, um, okay. third entry, that's the port redirection. What I'm talking now about is the environmental variables, right? You guys remember from Heroku, you need to specify the port variable, right? Environmental variable port, right? So you need to consume that from whoever gives it to you doing instantiation, right? So here you have a similar thing. In this particular um, uh, compose file, we have environment variables under the tag environment and uh, under the key environment. And it includes, for example, the MySQL root password. Is that a clever idea to put this into your Docker compose file and put this into your repository? Uh, who, say, who thinks, yes, that's a super clever idea like this? Cool, thank you. Um, right, so there's this. There's always a bit uh, of, of probabilistic noise, but effectively no one thinks it's a really clever idea, right? So, so how do you do it? I'm not sure how I would do it actually, because there are no safe way to store a password. Yeah. The safe way is kind of not to store it at all, I guess, right? Yeah. So that would be one pathway. So no, what, what you can do in Docker Compose to deal with this issue is you have a fixed uh, environmental file that you can provide, that you can use. And um, you can, for example, keep that. In this case, I did so, or I plan to do so. We need to check if it's actually there. Um, in your repository. Of course, you don't commit this, right? They add it to git ignore, so you only have the file locally, the environmental file. And then it's also flexible, right? So if you have a collaborative environment, you just keep the environment file local and only commit everything else. So that's the idea um, of how to work around it. So it's best practice not, unless it's, super generic global variables um, not to specify them actually as part of the um, Docker Compose file. So that's the, the, the direction there. The next thing you do is basically specify, okay, what do I want to build, right? So, um, so in which directory do I find the Docker file that is going to be executed as part of the build? And it happens to be it's in the um, subdirectory um, CMD of uh, and, and student DB um, and it will actually build that service uh, dynamically. So that's the idea. This, the next thing is then port redirection. Hang on, indentation right. By the way, one thing to bear in mind when you deal with um, YAML, the indentation is, is the key um, formatting mechanism, right? So like in Python, so you need to get that right. Um, and we depend on something and let's for the sake of analogy also law called that DB so that's how you in declare dependencies and then we also declare a network so the networks uh, a host is connected to in the last session we also talked about uh, the different types of networking that you can do in docker briefly a host network uh, what other forms of networking were there please bridge yeah what is bridge doing uh, I don't remember specifically yeah Okay, so um, anyone? Rich? No? So it's basically it's a um, network that is kind of contained in the host itself but has access to the outside world, right? So, and it allows you to have internal networks that are contained, uh, since we're on it, that are contained within the host, right? So, okay, now's the time where I need to hope that it's not permanent. Yes. Let's try. Is it default in Docker using? That's correct. Uh, it's just, if I don't it correctly, it's just that's like a switched network in uh, router. That's correct. That's exactly how it is. So you have this host here. The only thing you have to do to map 
ports that you want to access inside your uh, containers explicitly, right? Using the port mapping uh, structure. But you're right, it's kind of a virtual network inside uh, your Docker host uh, particular, right? But it's only over a single machine. So um, what if you want to do it across multiple hosts, what's the type of network, what's the type of network you need to use? Anyone? No? It's called... They refer to it as an overlay network that you can uh, arrange. So then you uh, have you have bit, you emulate the capability of Docker Swarm, and that you yeah please. Uh, in a single Docker Compose stack, the overlay network is created by default for that stack. Ah okay, and so you don't need to specify the machines or Um Okay, yeah. Uh, do Docker have uh, support for VLANs as well? No. Not for now, so. But you need to make it explicit um, that you expose ports anyway, so. Let's do that. So it takes a while here, yeah? sorry. I should have copied and pasted it some more. Student net. All right, so what am I doing here? So I have the first service that I called web that relies on an environmental file that is, um, has a Docker file in its build directory. Port mapping depends on DB and sits on the same network as DB. Well, that's a surprise. Um, and in addition to services, let me get the indentation right. Uh, yep. We have volumes. Um, and we call this DB data. And what else do we have? We have networks that we all share. Student net. All right. So if we're lucky, that whole thing works. So basically, that's all what you would do, right? So it sits on the next higher level. You specify the services and then hopefully run it. And the way of running this thing is you, uh, using, hang on, do I have sudo doc docker compose installed here, actually? That's ah, cool. There's something there. Um, actually, let's do the native thing. Ah, hang on. So before I do that, um, I need to bring down some services because I have a bit of a um, uh, quite some services running here already, um, and they will conflict because I want to use port 8080 and port 2717. So I say, um, look, uh, stop Mongo. Did I name this thing Mongo? No, it's, I didn't name it at all. So it's Quizical Williams. Okay, I, I never thought I would say that on a stream, anyway. Um, and the student container as well. So we get rid of our uh, local insta um, setups, the manually created containers and so on. In fact, worst of all, you also need to uh, remove them entirely. Right now, if we run Docker PS, we don't see anything, right? So, but they're actually still there, the containers, just waiting to be reinstantiated. Also, if you have uh, run Docker containers with uh, port parameters, environmental variables and so on, those will be automatically uh, reused again if you just uh, say docker run, right? So um, you, you don't need to re-specify them uh, again. Um, by the way, that's, yeah, so that's that's um, one of the challenges. Docker RM and we get rid of student container. We get rid of Mongo uh, typo. And we get rid of the Quizzical Williams. Oh, we get rid of everything, actually. OK, and then we just say sudo docker compose uh, up. Let's see how it goes. Oops. I made some mistake in my docker compose file. sudo nano docker. Network is mapping, not a string. What did I do? Bottom line, you're probably missing a colon. I miss a colon. You're absolutely right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And ah, right, the environmental file, of course. So I promised to provide an environmental file, yet haven't done it. So where do I want to put it? Hang on. Uh, Docker compose. It should be in command student db and then dot env. Okay. I don't have anyone there. No, okay. Um, so which variants do I need to use? That's something you will not um, recall because we talked about it in the last session. Um, 
call this beast Mong uh, DB, I suspect, I suspect. And this is going to be appended to the file env. And what other variables did we have? Um, password. No, it's password free. Um, port, I believe, right? Port 8080, I think. Good. Right. Those are the entries now. Um, so DB host points to the database name, the, the host of the database name, the, the, the container host name right now. And port 8080 is the port on which um, the web API should be exposed. So let's see if that goes. Uh, or what else I uh, didn't do yet. So compose up. Ah, cool. It's doing stuff. So you notice that they actually built an image first. You see those initial point. Ah, now it's too late. Um, you saw the initial few points. Basically, if the image doesn't exist yet, it will basically download all the necessary uh, stuff. For example, the Golang environment, the sources using GoGet, and so on. We'll cache them, of course, and then build the image and provide it, and then start the database. So I ran uh, Docker, Docker Compose just saying Docker Compose up, and it basically means that you see the entire output immediately, and it also will block your console. Uh, I mentioned that if you don't. So how do you how do you how do you keep your system interactive? How do you prevent the fact that it's uh, in foreground? Please. Dash D. Dash D. Right. Detached. That's right. So you do the detached execution. So internally, however, let's look at it. It's actually creating two containers, and they are named uh, after your, your project you're working with. So in this case, IMT twenty six eighty one students web one and DB one. Right. So it's a structured approach behind under the hood. Basically, you see those. Well, now you don't because they're not running. PS-A, you see those containers, right, that they are generated. So it's basically as if you do it from hand, it's just done for you in, in uh, Docker Compose. So let's, let's follow your advice and say um, Docker Compose up with dash D for detached. That was the wrong, what did I do wrong? Probably the other way around. Um, if I'm in the right directory anyway, yep. So it basically just says, well, you know, I'm starting the containers now. And you see it's a lot faster now because everything has been, you know, generated in the system already and it's just brought up again and uh, can run from here. So, right, so if you have a bit more of a complex system consisting of multiple services that interact and are dependent on each other, that's the way to go, right? So you write the Docker files first and then you deal with this uh, on top of it. So any um, thoughts or questions regarding this? Please. Uh, would you uh, deploy this to Heroku using uh, the, the git push Heroku master? Right. Um, so the, that's, where the, that's where Heroku ends a bit. Um, because this is really like on the lower level. So Heroku is more like a platform as a service, or it is a platform as a service environment. And it's very specific to the environment you, you want to build, Go in this case, right? Okay. And here we are one level deeper in that we're actually more on the infrastructure. We're kind of building virtual hardware now in the form of containers. We don't think in terms of programming languages necessarily anymore. In fact, we are agnostic about the fact that there is a, a, a Mongo database in this one and a web a service uh, in, uh, in the other one. So no, this is, beyond, this is an IAS, infrastructure as a service uh, um, approach. So the only way for us to use it would be either to use, for example, um, the Amazon uh, Docker services that they provide or to host it on uh, OpenStack ourselves. Okay. So that's why you access to and which you can do. So um, yeah, so that's clearly outside of the past territory. Or do you know any way of running Docker containers on Heroku? No, no right? So no. I don't think they will uh, ever support this because that's outside their objectives. Um, so I give you 10 minutes break. So uh, 10 past or 12 past um, three, and then we we'll briefly continue. The only thing I want to show you and then you're relieved from Docker, yes. Um, will be how to build um, efficient images, especially if you're using Go. Um, that's the last bit, which is kind of relevant for this course uh, since we're using Go and something you should know. <laughs>